Thank you for watching the That's Rare podcast, episode 16. On this episode, we had Becky Reed, the COO of Bank Social. This was an amazing episode you're sure to love. We talked about the difference between credit unions and banks, the history of how credit unions were formed, how credit unions are adopting blockchain technology, uh, Bank Social and the wallet they've introduced, the stable token they've introduced. So much was talked about, regulation of the blockchain industry of the United States. So much information was shared here. I'd like to really thank Becky for coming on the That's Rare podcast so early on in our infancy. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for all the viewers out there watching. Hit the like and subscribe button and let's get right into it. Don't miss out on Rare Evo 2024. For a limited time, early bird, general admission, and VIP tickets are now 50% off. Buy your tickets now and secure your spot at next year's event. Here we are live with episode number 16 of the Rare Network podcast. We've got an amazing one here. We've got Becky Reed, the COO of Bank Social. Becky, nice to have you on. How's it going this morning? right after it, the holiday <laughs> right it's great hey happy holidays right so i'm happy everything's good awesome thanks for coming on i want to kick it off you have an amazing background in finance would love to introduce yourself to the folks that don't know who you are kind of touch on your background and and how you got to where you're at great thank you rand so i am a 27 year credit union veteran I have spent the last decade as a CEO of a credit union. I've actually headed up two different credit unions. Um, I am a, a native Texan, and so um, most of my experience in the credit union space has been here in Texas, uh, but I also traveled to Nebraska for a period of time to take uh, the helm of a credit union there. So um, I, I have also been a technology enthusiast throughout my career. Being a Gen Xer, I kind of have that, you know, uh, experience at the forefront of of technology with the internet, rudimentary networks, um, desktops, you know, kind of coming into being. Uh, when I started in the credit union space, nobody even had a website. <laughs> Debit cards didn't even exist. Uh, so I, I've definitely seen the evolution of technology in my industry. And in 2015, I co-founded a technology company. So credit unions are allowed to invest in and own for-profit companies as long as they help other credit unions. And those are called Credit Union Service Organization, or the acronym is CUSO, C-U-S-O. And I co-founded a technology CUSO back in 2016 that focuses on um, primarily the infrastructure side of the house, right? So networking, managed services, cloud services, those kinds of things. And um, so I really delved into the network architecture side of things. Now I am not a network architect, <laughs> but I can speak network architect. And so um, because of my ability to kind of speak geek, and I am an uber geek, by the way, um, I'm a huge Star Trek fanatic. Um, and so because of that and, and my interest in technology, that kind of led me down the path to discovering uh, blockchain technology uh, and ultimately um, being introduced to the whole DeFi movement. I love that. So for those who don't know, what's the difference between a credit union and a bank? So credit unions is kind of interesting because credit unions were actually started in the 1860s in Germany as financial cooperatives. So basically there were farmers who were being taken advantage of by money lenders. And this is kind of a common story, right? This happens over and over throughout history. And, um, and anyway, so the people got fed up and said, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. And so we're just going to start our own financial institution. And that was the, the foundations of financial cooperatives in Europe. And uh, Edward Filene brought that idea to the United States in the early 1900s. And he's kind of known as the father of credit unions. And the Federal Credit Union Act um, came about in 1934. 
and was signed by FDR. So, uh, you know, that's kind of historically what we are, but, but why we're different is because credit unions are member owned, meaning they are financial cooperatives that are owned by their members. They're democratically controlled by their owners, which are their members and they're not for profit. And so those are, are some of the key differentiators. There is absolutely a place for for-profit financial institutions, which are banks, um, but banks, customers are not their owners. And, you know, they're two separate things. So in a credit union, the people who are the customers also own the financial institution. So it's a little bit of a different um, difference philosophically and on the balance sheet as well. I feel like it's almost aligned a little better with blockchain, um, to be honest, in the way it's kind of set up and then the DAO, which we'll get into that a little bit later. But yeah, I think that uh, that was kind of an interesting to note, the difference between a bank and a credit union, uh, something I learned studying a little bit for the podcast here today. So that was really cool. And I figured uh, it was good for people to know. And you've been in the industry for quite some time, and it seems like you've been able to see some of the pitfalls of you know, the infrastructure and the build of what's going on. And how did you find blockchain specifically? Well, it was kind of interesting. Um, so because of my interest in networking and, you know, think back to the 2015, 2016 timeframe. And in 2015, I took my credit union uh, into the cloud. And so we went 100% virtual servers to desktops. Um, we used hyperconvergence and some of the, the, the more recent technology at the time um, as it related to cloud infrastructure. And uh, that, that process helped my credit union achieve economies of scale without having to, to grow our assets significantly um, just using technology. And uh, so because of my interest in networking um, and cloud infrastructure, uh, I first started paying attention to blockchain, not because of Bitcoin, because I really am not a cryptocurrency enthusiast. Of course, I had heard about Bitcoin, um, but blockchain technology being a decentralized network fascinated me. And so there was a, a credit union startup, a QSO. I spoke about those earlier, and it was called CU Ledger. And it was kind of a, of a research and development QSO that was taking a look at burgeoning technology, which was blockchain technology specifically, and um, was looking, uh, I read an article in one of our trade publications about CU Ledger, and they were going to start a private blockchain in the credit union space. And they were looking for credit unions that would host the node. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. Right. Because, I mean, we had all virtual servers and everything. So I was like, oh, let's just spin up a server and host a node. This just sounds really cool. So I talked to the folks at Pure IT, which is the QSO I co-founded about that. They also thought it was pretty cool. However, competing interests took over. Right. And I was like, you know what? There's really no monetary benefit, really no benefit to our members for doing this right now. We have a lot of other initiatives on our plate. I'm going to use my political capital to, to do those things and not try to convince my board to do kind of this side pet project, right? So mm -hmm. I put it kind of on the back burner. And um, so we didn't, my credit union did not do that. But that was kind of the beginnings of my interest in blockchain. And then in 2020, and, you know, late 2019, but really 2020, when cryptocurrency just really exploded and Bitcoin went through the roof, um, that was when I really started going, OK, wait a minute. There is something amazing happening here. And specifically with cryptocurrency, it was going to disrupt payments. That's what I saw. Um, and what I understood about distributed ledger technology at the time, I was like, I need to be paying attention to this. So that was really kind of um, the, the beginnings of, of my curiosity uh, with blockchain. I love that. And like I, I kind of, too, went through the same thing of like finding it back in 2015 and touching on it, but not really understanding and didn't really want to use my social capital to basically bring it up with folks or anything like that. Uh, saw a lot of people get wrecked around Christmas and the holidays of 2017. 
probably bringing it to their family. Um, and then the next two years was pretty difficult. And I kind of put it down for a while until 2020 myself. And I think a lot of people went through that similar path. Um, tell us how you found Bank Social. Like, how did that come about? I'd love to kind of dive into that a little. Well, you mentioned earlier when I was talking about what a credit union is and kind of some similarities and some maybe some shared ethos with DeFi. Well, absolutely, yeah. that is there. And I noticed that really early on. And so I when I started in 2020, started really diving into, oh, my gosh. And then I heard about DAOs. I was like, holy cow, that's just a digital credit union. And I, I was just like, wow, this, I just really enamored with the space. And so I'm very um, prolific on LinkedIn. I post a lot. I have a lot of followers. Um, and I usually just kind of, I mean, I don't really have a plan about it. I just post what interests me and, uh, and, you know, people follow me and they like it. And uh, we have conversations about it. And um, I was posting a lot about distributed ledger technology and uh, about how cryptocurrency was going to disrupt payments and kind of the similarities between, you know, that ecosystem and credit unions. And uh, in January of 22, I got hit up by a guy named John Wingate. John Wingate is the founder of Bank Social. And uh, he messaged me and um, he was like, hey, I want to talk to you about a blockchain credit union. And I went, wow, this guy shares some of the same interests and ideas that I have. I definitely want to talk to him. So I thought he was contacting me because of all the stuff I'd been posting. Well, <laughs> No, he wasn't. He actually just did like a shotgun approach on LinkedIn for credit union CEOs because he was starting a credit union. And he got some advice from the National Credit Union Administration, which is the regulatory agency that oversees credit unions, that if you want to start a credit union, he kind of already gotten down the path of that. And if you want to start a credit union, they said you should probably get an advisor who works in the space to kind of help you along. So that's why he was contacting me because I was a credit union person, not because I was a crypto person. Wow, <laughs> so, wow. I know. And so it just um, happenstance. It, it was serendipitous. And the interesting thing is now that we've um, been almost going on two years now and um, that we've been working together, um, it, pretty much any path that he would have taken probably would have led him to me because I was speaking a lot about it in the credit union space. And so anybody who knew me in the credit union space, if he talked to them, they would have said, you need to talk to Becky. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a, an interesting thing. But we uh, together started talking about where we should progress next. So Bank Social at that time had a self-custody crypto exchange and uh John, again, was going down the path of starting a credit union because Bank Social also has a DAO. And he, too, saw the similarities between the DAO, which is a digital representation of kind of what a credit union does, you know, democratically controlled, one member, one vote, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, consensus mechanisms for it's just all done digitally in a, in a DAO, whereas in a credit union, it's kind of analog. So. Uh, we just went down um, the path trying to figure out what the best thing to do uh, was. And uh, Lone Star Credit Union, the credit union where I was the CEO, uh, we launched the self-custody crypto exchange in August of 22 and uh, the stablecoin Rivia in October of 22. So those were some initiatives we did together while I was still the CEO of Lone Star. And then in July of 23, I actually joined Bank Social full time as the chief operating officer. I love that. That is like a great story of how you guys came together and a great representation of your history in credit unions and the financial space and how you guys came together. And I kind of want to bring up the bank social website now um, and let you kind of go over a little bit of what you guys have there. I have a few questions around it. So we've touched on it a little bit. Oh. Proper showing here. There we go. We touched on it a little bit. 
And so is bank social, what exactly is it? Is it infrastructure for other credit unions? Are you guys your own credit union? What exactly is both a little bit of both? I, I heard you say credit unions are allowed to kind of basically invest and build for others. So is that that kind of click for me in the beginning here? Is that what's happening? What exactly is bank social, Becky? Well, first of all, we are a lot of things. So we have two different kind of personas that we uh, serve. So we have the crypto connoisseur. Um, so Bank Social provides a self-custody crypto exchange, which to my knowledge is the only one um, here in the United States um, uh, and maybe even globally, but that's actually um, also used for institutional um, clients. Um, but a, a self-custody crypto exchange, uh, John started that back in um, late 2021. And um, that provides uh, crypto connoisseurs in the DeFi space, the ability to purchase uh, cryptocurrencies that they can own and custody themselves, which is a different model um, than, you know, a uh, some of the other popular exchanges that are out there, which are custodial. And so that is one area. There is also the DAO. Of course, the DAO is not controlled by Bank Social, but um, there is a Bank Social token. Um, there are delegates of the DAO, and the DAO actually um, participates in some commercial lending. Um, the, the, the Bank Social token holders that choose to stake their tokens uh, can participate in. And so that was all started prior to me meeting uh, John Wingate. And the DAO is a Wyoming LLC. And uh, so that's kind of that side of things. So that's the D5 side of the house. That's the consumer facing side of the house. So then if you go to, I think, products and look at credit unions, um, Yep, under Credit Unions Crypto Exchange and Verified. So there are several different products that Bank Social has created in order to serve the credit union space. So the CFPB uh, has recently come out with a proposed rule that says that financial institutions here in the United States need to be able to participate in open banking. Open banking is where uh, financial institution core databases have to be able to talk to each other and interact with each other in the best interest of the consumer. And it's interesting because the CFPB has actually mentioned specifically in the proposed rule, decentralized. And that right there tells me that there is a place for distributed ledger technology to participate in open banking. And the products that Bank Social has built for institutions, credit unions specifically, is all around that bank, that open banking concept. So we have a digital identity, we have a stable coin, we have a um, wallet, a multi-chain uh, wallet that actually just got released a couple of weeks ago, updated, um, uh, that provides all sorts of benefits, including staking. So that is for uh, institutional uh, clients. And then we are a, a third party approved third party provider for both RTP and FedNow as well. So kind of taking it through identity all the way through payments in order to create that open banking feel with a digital wallet uh, where the members of the credit unions can interact with their digital assets as well as their uh, fiat assets that are sitting in their credit union account. So two sides of, of what Bank Social does. We have a consumer facing side and then we have the institutional product uh, side uh, as well. So that that's kind of a glimpse into what we do. I love that so much. Um, so many questions pop up to mind when talking about like the exchange and how it's self custody. Is there a limit or like how many cryptos can be how many like pairs of trading pairs do you have in that exchange? Is it just like a top set of them to USD? How does that kind of work? Yeah, so um, we are a licensed money service business. We are licensed by FinCEN. And so we have to follow 
rule similar to a financial institution. Um, but basically in a self-custody situation, we warehouse digital assets. And then when you as a customer come in to purchase a digital assets, we're basically selling you from our cryptocurrency what from hold. the inventory that we mm -hmm. hold. Right. So mm -hmm. kind of a warehouse um, uh, scenario. And it doesn't have to be digital assets. It can be, you know, widgets. Right. right. So just kind of look at it that way. And then we just transfer it from our warehouse and put that in your wallet and then you self custody it and, and you can do whatever you want with it. But yes, bank social uh, warehouses, uh, we have the ability to warehouse dozens of different cryptocurrencies. However, just like any warehouse that has an inventory, we generally keep what's most popular. Uh, also, we try to stay away from the, the speculative meme coins that are, you know, kind of on the peripheral of, uh, of what is typical or, or um, standard. Uh, in the space. And so, as you can imagine, we have all of the uh, most popular tokens available, uh, which include Bitcoin, Ethereum, HBAR, our bank social token, and our stablecoin Rivia, and, and a few others. I love that. I really love that a lot. And how is the, I know stable tokens have had such a bad rap over the past two years, so it's really awesome that you guys have created one. It's still alive. Is yours um, asset backed? Is it algorithmic? What kind of stable token are we talking here for those that are interested? Well, you just mentioned that stable coins have gotten a bad rap. And I think the yeah. reason they've gotten a bad rap is because, yes, they're asset backed. But um, in many cases, they're uh, backed by assets that aren't immediately liquid. And uh, even if they're short term, liquidity like a, a bond. Um, you know, you might be able to get the money in 24 hours or 36 hours, but it's not on demand, right? Um, and frankly, um, the stable coins, the most popular stable coins that are out there today are kind of centralized. <laughs> I mean, all of the money for the stable coin uh, that is liquid is pretty much kept in one financial institution. That's it. And so, you know, th there really aren't a lot of options uh, from a stablecoin perspective that are decentralized and liquid. And that's what our stablecoin is. The Rivia stablecoin um, is asset backed by the dollar that was used to purchase it sitting in multiple credit union accounts here in the United States. And that money is never rehypothecated by uh, Rivia, which is the company that issues the, the token. And um, that money is always dollar for dollar back proof of reserve um, that is verifiable on chain. So um, that's what's different about our stablecoin. I love that. That is awesome to hear and kind of reassuring as we move forward. I didn't, I've never really thought about that, like thinking of the other large stable coins players in the space um they are very very centralized and where the capital stored even if it is in you know u.s treasury bonds or whatever it may be and um that's a really good point that you bring up there becky um something that definitely hits home is all of this infrastructure in place and usable now for somebody like myself um yes i i know you, it is okay you guys oh, had yeah. a great a large announcement at North American Blockchain Summit, what what was that announcement? So the announcement was the proposed Defy Federal Credit Union that uh, we and a bunch of other credit union enthusiasts and um, uh, blockchain enthusiasts in the space have come together to create. So the proposed Defy Federal Credit Union will be the first credit union that will allow digital asset and DeFi enthusiasts to participate in the Web3 space via a regulated traditional financial institution that they own, which is a credit union. And so that was our big announcement at the North American uh, Blockchain Summit. We are in the process. We have uh, picked back up the torch that John started back in 2021 uh, when he was starting a credit union. 
shortly after he had started the Dow. And so now we've picked that uh, initiative back up and uh, are going through the process of getting a federal credit union charter in order to serve uh, the DeFi space using the bank social technology as its backbone. Congratulations. That is really cool. That's an amazing announcement. Congratulations to you all on that. And so what this infrastructure is all built on Hedera. Can you speak a That's bit correct. on your choices on that and why Hedera and uh, kind of what led you down that path? Right. So um, first of all, we love Hedera and we love the folks at Hedera. They have just been absolutely wonderful to work with and uh, true pioneers in the space. And and I'll explain why um, uh, we know that, uh, not just believe it, but know that. Um, so let's kind of look at at the past for blockchain, right? So then there, there was Bitcoin, which was created as a decentralized mechanism of moving a stored value digitally, right? So I don't have to have an intermediary. I don't have to have a middleman in order to send you a, a stored value um, uh, with a token. So that was Bitcoin. So then we kind of moved into Ethereum, right? Which um, uh, offered programmability and there were some mechanisms that were available on Ethereum that just weren't available with uh, Bitcoin. So it started kind of with Bitcoin. This is what I say all the time. It started with Bitcoin, but it didn't end there. So then we have Ethereum, which um, offered programmability, smart contracts, being able to do some different things um, with uh, DAOs, for example, with the voting mechanisms. I mean, there's some things that, that are really cool about Ethereum. And so then we have Ethereum. Well, in both cases, when you think about the uh, the node operators, there's different mechanisms, of course, utilized uh, on both a traditional blockchain and Ethereum, of course, which just moved to um, proof of stake as a proof as opposed to proof of work. Well, the governance model of those, you know, I mean, it, sometimes it can be a little problematic, right? So then Hedera came about with their hash graph mechanism and the governing council, which was a completely new and different way to think about a distributed ledger governance model. So the node operators um, on Hedera are Fortune 500 companies. Um, I think there's 28 of them now. Um, and the companies like Google, like Dell, um, uh, like IBM, and they, the council seats, host a node, and that's how it works. They also took a very economic, I'm sorry, environmental, yes, there's a, a, a pretty sexy economic model as well, but a, a very environmental approach to operating the network. And uh, they really have um, a focused on uh, having a, a net zero carbon footprint, which is uh, very cool. And then from an economic perspective, the transactions on chain are predictable and are priced in US dollars, as opposed to being priced in HBAR, which may um, float around. So those are some of kind of the main differences on why we chose uh, Hedera. We believe that Hedera is and will be the premier uh, use case uh, for distributed ledger technology for businesses. And so that's why we've built everything on Hedera. I love that. When we were at uh, North American Blockchain Summit, and we saw the Hedera sign on there. I was really, really surprised. And we were searching around the whole expo hall. We were like, where is the Hedera project? I've got to find it uh, to speak to you guys, because we were just really surprised uh, to see one there. It was very, very Bitcoin focused at that event. Um, and to see somebody True. kind of beyond that a little bit um, and talking about smart contracts and what can happen for for businesses with the centralized ledgers, we were uh, really excited to find you guys in the booth you had and to talk and what led us here today. So that's really, really cool. And so with Hedera and everything like that, has it been pretty easy to integrate? I know the token you guys have is an ERC-20 token and everything like that. Have the infrastructures come together pretty well between both? 
Yeah. So now I'm not a developer, but I can speak geek. So, um, so I can speak to it, but I'm not a developer. John yeah. Wingate is the, the developer, but yes, it, it, um, has not been uh, problematic, uh, whatsoever. Uh, we're super excited too with our bank social wallet 2.0 that just came out that offers the ability to hold your H bar alongside your Ethereum and your Bitcoin. And uh, that is an, a novel uh, approach. Um, but but yes, absolutely. We've been able to uh, to play um, both in the ERC-20 space as well as the, um, the, the hash graph uh, space and, um, uh, you know, without any uh, without any issues. I love that a lot. And for folks that want to use you know, the credit union and things like that. It, it seems very interesting that it's like self custody with identity. How do you guys, are you doing like traditional credit checks and things like that for borrowing and lending? How does collateral work? Like, do I still get to hold my collateral in my own custody? Um, how does all that work with you guys, like as a bank? Well, so let's talk about, so the credit union uh, certainly is uh, one aspect um, of uh, TradFi, right? So mm -hmm. you, you've, you've got your traditional financial institution that is regulated and that you can trust. And then you have your digital wallet that opens up access to the Web3 space, which could offer you the ability to do things like lending, but in Web3. Right. So it, it would be and this is already happening today. This is not something that is new. There are plenty of folks that stake their tokens uh, for some sort of lending or return, uh, you know, that something that looks like a money market account, for example. A lot of mm -hmm. that was happening in 2020. So um, so this is not new in the DeFi space. It's just now being able to have the opportunity to have your credit union account, which holds your fiat, right? And now you've got access um, through the bank social wallet into the DeFi space. I mean, you know, the world, I mean, th there's really no limit to what you can do. So you just asked about in a self custody way, can you hold your assets? Well, absolutely. Let's say that, um, you know, you want to uh, do a loan on your car. Well, we can turn that car That's, into an NFT. You beat right? to it. And then, you know, other folks can participate in that, that opportunity. So yes, the sky's the will, limit will you guys uh, be on doing uh, what we can do. Will you guys be doing like traditional lending, like mortgage loans and things like that? And like, so I just refinanced a home a couple years ago and I had the most trouble explaining to them you know, they were like, where's your proof of reserves? And I'm like, well, I don't keep it in a bank um, because it's making me money over here in DeFi and I'll happily show you six figures over here. But they couldn't use that um, in the traditional loan process as my assets. Is that, that's what I'm really interested in. Is that something possible with your credit union in the future to actually be like, okay, those are reserves that this gentleman has that are accessible and things like that. Like, is that something that Bank Social would be able to do in the future? So the really cool thing about credit unions, because credit unions are owned by their members. So what mm. that means is that credit unions are able to create products and services that meet the specific needs of their members. So there's very there's an opportunity for very niche groups of people to create their own financial products and services through a regulated financial institution in a, a regulated and compliant way that serve their specific needs. So that's why you see teachers credit unions and, you know, credit unions that focus on the healthcare industry and, you know, credit union for truckers and whatever the case may be, because a group of people or a that shared a common bond common interest came together to create a financial institution that helped them. And this is no different. Now, the really cool thing too about the credit union space that is also similar to the DeFi space is there's a lot of collaboration that happens. So even though credit unions in some cases might compete for the same members, they really have grown up as being let's share with each other as opposed to to try to compete 
with each other. Um, uh, most credit union people feel like we just want you to belong to a credit union. If you belong to ours, that's great. If you belong to the one next door, that's great too. You can belong to both of them. That's awesome. You know, we might serve different needs of yours. And so the great thing about the proposed Defy Federal Credit Union is we have a network of 4,000 credit unions in the United States. We don't have to necessarily create a mortgage product. But what we can do is through a QSO, perhaps, create an opportunity for mortgage lending or whatever kind of lending that other credit unions would be able to participate in from a liquidity perspective and create a product that serves the needs of the DeFi community specifically. So yes, absolutely, that's a possibility with the proposed DeFi Federal Credit Union, but it's a little different than what you're thinking. It's not necessarily that DeFi will offer those, but we will make available to our members an opportunity um, to get that type of service while allowing the industry as a whole to participate in that experience. I love that. That makes a lot of sense. And it's like if you're a credit union for truckers, like you said, versus one for teachers, you guys can share with each other about how to run a credit union. There's, you know, there's a little bit of overlap there in that you're both credit unions, but you're serving two different spaces and can work together. And sometimes, you know, you might be a part of two different credit unions or something like that. Sure. So that's, that's really interesting. And so really what I take from this is I need to participate in the DAO um, and, and make sure that there's a BIP about getting mortgages for myself the next time I need to refinance um, as a member and that it suits my needs as a member of the credit union. Um, this makes sense. Also for something like our business, like I noticed our business, Rare Network, um, has issues with banking and things like that. You know, we've we've gotten around it, but definitely, you know, it seems like you guys are a place for businesses in this space to come to um, and be able to get those banking services needs met you guys are looking for both personal and business members. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And again, I go back to what I said originally, why credit unions are started and why it seems mm -hmm. to be a recurring theme throughout theme. history is people get left behind and get left out of the traditional financial ecosystem for a variety of reasons. And unfortunately, because of bad actors in this space, the banking industry, at least up until now, who knows what might happen in the future, but up until now, anything with crypto involved in, in anything that you do is a no for them, right? It's too much risk. And so unfortunately, there are, like yours, legitimate companies that are just trying to run their business and meet their payroll, right? And have just regular financial you know, services like a checking account, you know, maybe yes. a little bit of, you know, a money market account or something to earn a little bit of dividends on the side. Um, so, but nothing, you know, super crazy. Um, but unfortunately, because of uh, the regulatory environment for banks right now, with the FDIC and the OCC kind of saying, you know, uh, you need to ask us permission before you do business with these folks. Many banks are saying it's not worth the, the effort. And so, you know, buy, you need to go find another financial institution. And, and yes, credit unions uh, can definitely serve uh, that need. And yes, the proposed the five federal credit union is kind of here to show the way uh, so that um, people who are disenfranchised have a place to go, just like we always have. Makes a lot of sense. And you touched on regulation there. And I know I wanted to ask about you know, we're on the heels of 2024 and these ETF approvals and things like that. Where do you see that going or really in general, just regulation in the United States? It seems like you've got your finger on the pulse pretty well when it comes to that. So would love to hear, you know, your thoughts on just the direction of regulation here in the U.S. Sure. What's kind of interesting about what's happening um, with the ETF with uh, Bitcoin um, is that you know, once that happens and it, and it looks right now like it's going to happen, um, the SEC is going to approve it. They've had applications already. Um, and, and I think in January it's, it's going to come, 
to, to be. It's going to come about. What's interesting about that is now we're kind of starting to come in to TradFi, right? So now it's like, okay, this is, you know, you know, something that I recognize, I can participate in it in a, in a way that I'm, that's familiar to me from a consumer perspective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to go on a exchange and buy Bitcoin, you know, which is super volatile, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe I'm uncomfortable with that. So now I can participate in an ETF on a traditional exchange that I'm familiar with, right? A NASDAQ or whatever. And so to me, that now, I mean, we've seen it. Of course, I thought it would happen a little quicker than it has. I think a lot of people in the DeFi space thought it would happen quicker than it has. But now we're starting to see kind of, okay, now this is starting to become more normal, right? This is more acceptable. This is something that, that people can get more comfortable with. And I think that is the beginnings of starting to see some regulatory clarity. There certainly are regulations that apply it, with cryptocurrencies in the DeFi space. There's consumer pr protection rules that are already out there. It's just there has been some ambiguity about whether they apply or not. And mm -hmm. in some cases, that's because some bad actors in the space have said, no, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> and so there's some ambiguity as well. Does it apply? Doesn't it apply? Well, I think in most cases it applies. But because there hasn't been somebody who really says, yes, this applies to you, the SEC certainly um, has taken some steps in that regard, um, but they do so through fines, right? Yeah. Um, they're not legislators. And so um, I, I think now that some of this is kind of coming into the forefront, I mean, heck, if, if my dad, who's 81, can um, participate on the NASDAQ with a Bitcoin fund, do what? I mean, yeah. that that makes it come into the mainstream. And so I think what you'll start to see, um, and I think 2024 will be an interesting year, we're going to start see to see some legislation um, uh, around that. Now, a lot of people get scared about that, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, that could, you know, we have to be really careful that Bitcoin specific legislation doesn't happen. It needs to encompass the whole ecosystem, not just Bitcoin. Um, but uh, I think that on the Hill, uh, when we're talking about the federal government specifically here in the United States, on the Hill, there are some really smart people who are talking to a lot of other smart people in this space, and they get it. And um, I personally am very optimistic and have faith that uh, that they will do the right thing, similar to the legislation that happened at the beginnings of the Internet um, that really allowed the United States to um, to be at the forefront of all the growth that happened in that space. And I think that that is what we will be seeing as we move into adopting more Web3 type technology. Um, once the clarity and the legislation um, around that um, is in place. I completely agree. And that was really well said, Becky. Uh, Thank you. Couldn't say, couldn't say it any better. I, I really honestly agree. And yeah, I'm glad to hear it from somebody like yourself as well, um, who's probably a lot more in tune than I am to hopefully be like, okay, maybe I'm on the right right path here. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see. What are some of the initiatives for Bank Social going into the new year? What are you guys looking forward to? Is there anything on the roadmap you can share with us um, that you guys are looking forward to in 2024? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, all of our products are, are built. Uh, we are not, you know, in product development, you know, on some things that, you know, all the things that I talked about are actually already ready for Bye. production and ready for prime time. Right. Um, and so the, the focus for 2024 is to really, um, start integrating these products, uh, more so into the credit union ecosystem, uh, we'll get DeFi launched and we're hoping to have that launched by the end of Q1. Hopefully, uh, that's not up to us. That's up to the NCUA to approve, uh, the charter. So we're kind of on their timeline there. Um, but definitely uh, in early 2024, we do expect that to uh, to be launched, which is very exciting. Uh, we will continue to make uh, updates and upgrades 
to our wallet, our bank social wallet, um, that will be coming out with some really cool features uh, this year. And so this year is just a year of growth and scale, honestly, and um, and the further furtherance, if that's a word, of um, of the the ecosystems that we uh, both love and feel have a commonality, which is credit unions and DeFi. That's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, it's good to hear you guys have built all the way through the bear market where kind of everybody's been in the background building and now you guys are ready to, you know, really get out there and for the community and credit unions to start using your infrastructure. I think um, it's perfect timing, let's say. Um, at, well, we, 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 and we agree with you. We took the opportunity to just heads down and build. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were very passionate about what we're doing. Uh, we feel like Web3 uh, is is going to be um, uh, exploding in the next uh, few years. And we feel like credit unions um, should live in that Web3 space because of that ethos we talked about before. Um, uh, you know, the, everybody sees it. It's so interesting that North American blockchain summit that we went to. I I wish credit unions could see that I wish more credit unions would come to those things because that whole grassroots feel, that energy that surrounds everything in Web3, that's like what it was in the 70s, 60s and 70s for credit unions here in the United States. That's the kind of feel that it had back then. And um, I wish credit unions could just witness the energy around Web3 because I think um, they would em embrace it uh, like I do. We love that. Um, that's exactly why we do Rare Evo, the event. And yeah, that the North American Blockchain Summit was amazing. Great content there. Some amazing speakers. A lot of the regulators they brought in were very interesting. Um, you know, to see how well Bitcoin has tied in with the oil and gas industry in North America is very, very interesting coming from somebody up north in the Midwest um, to come down there and see that and and tour well and all of that was very very interesting stuff and um to hear the conversations happening and all the politicians who were welcoming to come in there and give keynote speeches on this stuff i thought was very powerful and a big turnover um and i think you'll see a lot more of that if you come to rare evo um and a lot more enterprise um and people that are open-minded to to DeFi and what's much further beyond bitcoin um i think you'll see a lot of that at rare evo not to plug the event or anything but um I well think it was i get a good, I, good credit unions need to go to to events like that um and i i think that that if they did that you know i mean sometimes you you're in the forest right you, you can't yep. see the trees anymore because you're kind of in there you're used to your own space and you just keep hearing the same i mean and, and it's no different than any other space um mm -hmm. but to have that cross pollination between the two i think is just magical Absolutely. And so for those, this has been an amazing podcast, by the way, Becky, I really <laughs> oh, appreciate you. you taking the time the day after Christmas. I have learned a lot during this. So I know I'm going to be getting the comments of that was an amazing podcast. I learned a lot. I rewatched it three or four times. And you do some amazing writing on LinkedIn. I was reading through uh, a lot Thank of that you. since we got connected. Where do you want to drive people towards your LinkedIn? What's the best way for people to kind of understand what you're getting into and the things you're building is that Absolutely, the best way please yeah linkedin um, and then john wingate is pretty active on twitter i'm not as or x um yeah. uh, we do x spaces uh quite often and um that's a great place too we're very engaged with the hedera community as well and uh so you can follow john wingate on um x and you can uh, follow, well, you can follow both of us on either one, but me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I, I am very prolific on LinkedIn. I do post a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I've been reading through them. It's great, great material. And like, you're very insightful on what's happening in the industry and kind of how they meld together. I really like it a lot. Um, and then for those that want to learn more about bank social specifically, it's Twitter, Telegram, um, things like that. You guys have a YouTube channel. I noticed that's been up for several years now with some great educational mm -hmm. material on there. Anywhere I'm missing, where do you want people to go when they want to learn more about Bank Social? Banksocial.io 
rivia.finance and blockadvocates.org. Thank you so much, Becky. This has been an amazing podcast. I really appreciate the time and um, I hope to do this again with you as we get into 2024 and uh, you guys are able to make those announcements and see you all at Rare Evo. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rand. Thanks, Becky.